Anyway, it's my um, great pleasure today to introduce John McKeer, who I've known for many years and followed his work. If you haven't followed his work, which um, and maybe only a few of you are unaware of his work, I'd, I thoroughly recommend all of his writings. He's made a major contribution to economic history, history and, and particularly understanding uh, the Industrial Revolution, the, the source, the, the engines of wealth, uh, the uh, dynamics of economic growth and technological change. He's made a huge contribution over recent decades to this area. So welcome, Joel. The um, reason why we've invited him to this seminar is because um, Joel is one of the few economic historians who takes Darwinian evolution seriously. There's, there's some other economic historians talk about evolution, but as we all know, evolution is a vague word. Word doesn't mean you can't use it, but it doesn't necessarily mean a variation selection and so on. Uh, Joel, by contrast, uses these, these, these terms. He uses the D word, Darwinism, and he's done that brilliantly in his book on culture and, and growth, um, evolutionary theory. Um, so, Joe, welcome to our seminar. I'll hand over to you. The Thank you. Pr procedure for everybody is please turn off, except for Joel, please turn off your mic and your video camera. Um, recording is either started or will start soon, so we're being recorded. If you wish to ask a question, you may use the chat or uh, when the talk is finished, you can do the hand raising option and put up a hand and I'll try and um, keep in order and give everyone a chance. But maybe that would be difficult this time with the interest uh, this talk will attract. But anyway, over to you, Joe. We're looking forward to your to your talk. Thank you. Um, so let me start with a, sort of a uh, shameless self promotion for those of you who haven't yet bought a, a copy of this book. Um, what I'm going to talk about uh, today is in part based on some selections from a chapter in this in this book that came out a few years ago. Um, but I'm, you know, as I was preparing this talk, I've added all kind of new material. So the overlap is partial and, and not complete, but I thought I couldn't sort of avoid a little bit of shameless uh, self-promotion, you know, just like uh, I'm, I'm sort of my, my publisher expects me to do. So let me start talking a little bit about, um, as, as Jeff said, you know, that people have tried at some point to use Darwinian ideas. I mean, the word models is maybe a little bit over overstated here. The Darwinian ideas in economic history. So at first blush, you would think that this is a research area that, that is very amenable to such approaches. but. In fact, it has been slow. And if you look at economists who've been pushing a, 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 an evolutionary approach to um, economics, like especially my, you know, my former teacher, uh, Dick Nelson, um, it really, they, it hasn't really I think, spilled over very much to economic history. There have been some models in, um, in the past decades uh, that have used some Darwinian ideas uh, I would particularly point to a paper by, by Odette Gallo and, and Omar Moab, as well as the book by Gregory Clark that um, have used or evolutionary models or what they think of as evolutionary models. And, and here the, the basic idea is in some sense that there are, there are within the economy, the sort of high quality agents or people with entrepreneurial uh, talents and that they are most likely to perform well in this economy and therefore they're some sense as agents of economic growth and that these people also tend to have differential higher reproduction rates uh, so their share in the population keeps rising and, and, in, and in the process of population dynamics suggest that the uh, economy becomes more entrepreneurial and so in some in some way more successful so what the way this works and this is particular true i think in greg's work uh, is that um, differential reproduction works primarily through a larger number of surviving high quality children and so this leads to an expansion of the middle class and you know the cultural traits that these agents embody you know you could think of them as, as sort of middle class ethics or you know bourgeois ethics as dear McCloskey would call it 
And uh, so these eventually lead to uh, successful economic growth. And you know, my, my take on this is, this, you may take this or, or leave this, is that um, for technological progress to drive economic growth, we really do not need you know, a very large uh, section of the population to change, certainly not the entire middle class, whatever is meant by that. And so what I've been pushing in the last few years is that the critical variable in the kind of economic growth that's been experienced in the West since the Industrial Revolution, including our own time, is, is that the critical thing is something what I call upper tail human capital. And so this is basically sort of a small elite group of intellectuals, not, you know, just the heroes of the, of the Industrial Revolution as the Victorian hagiography would have it, but, you know, a, a, a group of intellectuals or what they called at the time natural philosophers, entrepreneurs, physicians, engineers, and highly competent sort of upper layer artisans who were the ones that who created the Industrial Revolution. And sort of bourgeois ethics that, that McCloskey is talking about may have mattered a great deal, but they aren't the ones that created the macro inventions or even had them uh, adopted. And so what I would argue is that if you start looking at the Industrial Revolution and everything that came after, you know, it requires a, a cadre of, of productive elites, you may call them. So, you know, mechanics and financiers and merchants and organizers. But this is still a, a tiny, a tiny sli sliver of the labor force. You know, with, you know, I calculated this to be, you know, somewhere around two or three percent, of course, based on some assumptions. And, you know, this is this is actually realized at the time. There's a quote by Robert Hooke, late 17th century, which I really like, although it's, it's it, in some sense, but in, in, by today's standards, probably politically incorrect. But he talks about who are the people who are pushing the frontier of useful knowledge. And he calls them a Cortesian army, you know, in analogy to Hernando Cortes, uh, well disciplined and regulated, so their numbers be but small. I mean, and so. I think that that in some sense captures uh, what I'm trying to say. And so to repeat, industrial revolution doesn't really require the transformation of the entire economy right away. It really needs a key group uh, and, po and pointing to differential reproduction may miss the crucial parts. So as I said, this is about two or three percent of inventors and but also what we have called tweakers and implementers so people who take the inventions and adapt them and tweak them and make minor improvements. And what I'm interested in is some kind of an evolutionary model of the cultural beliefs and capabilities of this elite group, far more than those population at large. OK, so when you focus on these people, I mean, their beliefs and ideas evolve over time. And I refer to that as, a, as what I call choice-based cultural evolution. So, you know, at base, what these people believed in is, I think, uh, above all, this sort of enlightenment notion of human progress. And, um, and, and you know, the book talks about this at, at nauseum, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but it basically is... Uh, and the novel idea that for progress is front possible, secondly, desirable, and three, and maybe most important, that it could be brought about by them and how to do it. And so specifically what these people believed in, and I think this is shared, even though the Enlightenment is, of course, a very large range of different beliefs, but I think the common denominator would be that material progress can be brought about by useful knowledge. And by useful knowledge, I just don't mean just science, but a whole bunch of sort of practical things like geography and uh, arithmetic and industrial roles of thumb, many of them based as much on intuition and, and dexterity and experience as they are on scientific principles. And that knowledge, if it expands and disseminates enough, would bring about uh, productivity growth. But, you know, what is really critical is that these people wrote a program of how to bring this progress about and then uh, you know, for better or for worse, carried it out. And, you know, bingo, there is the Industrial Revolution. And so without that belief in progress, my sense is that it was hard to see how any societies would have experienced an Industrial Revolution. And, um, you know, what's interesting here, and I could talk about this some more if people want me to, but of course the causality runs both ways. So, you know, certain events happen 
that make people feel that there has been progress in recent years. That's basically starting from the middle of the 15th century. And so as progress occurs, people start making it, feeling it that it's more credible. And so, um, and as it's more credible, they move on to bring about more. And so you get to sort of uh, uh, positive feedback between what's actually happening uh, and uh, what people believe. So then, now let me get to this to evolutionary models. And um, so, what I'd like to propose, and um, is to take the idea as the sort of unit of selection, rather than the carriers of ideas, which is the foundation of the sort of Galore and Moab and, and Clark work. So, uh, and that gets rid of the sort of hard problem of selection on human for groups. And the reason that that's a problem is, is I don't think that the idea is bad, but the problem is that the, the, the human generations are, you know, they are 25, 30 years. And so for anything that is based on, on, on uh, uh, select on, on differential reproduction, it will just take too much time, you know, by, by Gregory Clark's model, the industrial revolution should happen somewhere around 2500 uh, 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 AD. And, and so that, we're not Drosophila, and so you know, human generations are just too long to make this kind of work uh, uh, based on differential reproduction work. And so, what I'm actually interested in is that the cultural elements themselves, or the ideas, if you want, are subject to evolutionary forces. And so, now, just in general, I think evolutionary models are uh, are uh, you know larger than Richard Dawkins. They're larger than even larger than Charles Darwin, you know, as Jeff and, and Thornburn uh, pointed out already in 2010. Now they point out, and this is, I think everybody uh, listening to this will understand this right away and, and have thought about this for, for years. It involves selection, but the selection, of course, isn't the natural selection of differential reproduction. It's conscious choices made by individuals between menus of competing alternatives. And that's something, of course, that economists should be comfortable with because choice is, of course, f foundational to any kind of economic thinking. So just very briefly, what kind of elements make cultural evolution uh, Darwinian? And of course, one is that there is a great deal of variation on, on which people can make choices. And uh, these are, that variation is the result of past innovations or, you know, in nature, past mutations. And so uh, many of these traits have to be shared by well-defined groups of individuals and to distinguish them from, quote, others. You know, those belong to, to, to other groups. But uh, unlike what we see in biology, the, the lines are often blurry and, and um, uh, and cultural overlaps are, are common, you know, and so, um, I mean, this is uh, something that, that evolutionary sounds intuitively right. So, for instance, Jews and Muslims will share a belief in a single God and a taboo on eating pork, but they're quite clearly socially distinct group in a way not dissimilar from species that share uh, the vast bulk of their genes, but are phenotypically, of course, quite distinct and reproductively uh, uh, disjoint. The second thing, of course, is that culture uh, 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 very much like genetic uh, information is passed on among individuals from generation to generation. And so, of course, it happens in two ways, as we all know. Uh, genetic transmission happens through the mitosis of eukaryotic cells. And then, of course, cultural transmission happens through socialization and learning in, in cultural processes. So what we all, I think, uh, have, have known ever since, you know, uh, Boyd and Richardson uh, made this very explicit, is that your children are being socialized by their parents, but parental socialization is not all there is to choice-based cultural evolution, because there is all kind of oblique and, and, and horizontal transmission. Uh, children are socialized by other children and by adults or non-parents. And even as adults, they can still be subject to persuasion, which I have a lot more to say about it later on, and other forms of what I would call cultural ontogeny. And so they have, they have choices to make. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about in a minute has to do with this notion of persuasion, okay, which is essentially what choices consist of among these uh, productive elites. And the third thing, which is also quite, quite uh, uh, obvious, is that there are too many cultural features so that individuals have to choose among menus. And so selection is really at the basis of things, you know. So and this is in some ways, 
you know, parallel uh, to what drives in evolution is what we call super fecundity. Okay, not all those who are born will be, you know, uh, will actually survive. And this is sort of the Darwinian struggle for existence. And of course, you know, cultural features are super fecund in, in, in the trivial sense that there are far too many ideas for everybody to, to, to absorb. And that um, selection must be taking place among sometimes enormous menus. So just to give you one obvious and almost trivial example, you know, 10, 000, apparently there are 10,000 distinct religions in the world. I didn't know that, but that's what I'm told. And there are 6,800 different languages. So no individual can believe in all these religions and speak all those languages. You know, one has to choose. And the question is, you know, how? And so now I should add, you know, and this is based on, you know, on, on, on a very nice paper by Alex Mesudi published, you know, by now a decade ago. It says the certain elements of, of, of Darwinian analysis should not be applied to cultural evolution because they, they just don't, don't fit. So, for instance, we, the so-called Weismann barrier, which essentially says that the acquired phenotypical characteristics aren't passed on, that doesn't apply here at all. Um, innovations or mutations aren't random. They take a, a direction, can be imparted by selection. Uh, and of course, the, the, the notion that uh, you know transmission happens through discrete units, which we call genes, it doesn't seem to be necessary in cultural evolution at all. So, uh, you know, you don't want to uh, push the push the um, analogy too long. So here's a whole bunch of caveats about you know the, about not shoehorning uh, too many uh, ideas from biology into into cultural evolution. For instance, uh, uh, it's not even clear what is meant by the biological concept of species and speciation, since if species are defined by reproductive isolation, and that's still the best definition I know, uh, there's no precise equivalent in, in a cultural context, even if cultural groups can be identified. And, uh, and the same is true for the concept of a generation, you know, I mean, it's not even what, it, what a generation is. Now, I should add, of course, that the notion of, of um, even the notion of the, the Weismannian barrier is no longer watertight because we know that bacteria can actually acquire genetic information uh, after mitosis, but never mind that. Uh, and it's also, of course, true that cultural evolution has no upper bound in the number of sources uh, of information, um, whereas a new organism gets its chromosome from at most two sources, and we can get them from, from many, and um, and that these things happen all over its existence. So in that sense, you know, as Maria Kronfelder, Kronfeld pointed out in, in, in years ago, that's in some sense what makes it uh, uh, Lamarckian. And as I said, you know, there, there's absolutely no reason to believe that innovations and new ideas uh, of any kind uh, occur at random. Uh, there's a large literature in the economics of technological progress, which is not uncontroversial, by the way, but I'm not going to get into that today, that, that essentially in economy, say high wage economies, there'll be a deliberate search for labor saving innovations, which are more likely to occur than say land saving innovations in a society in which land is, is, is abundant. So we would think that inventors and people who come up with new ideas would work on issues that for some reason have a high priority, you know, whether this is finding a smallpox vaccine or or developing a nu nuclear bomb or something like that. These things don't occur at random. They are driven by the environment. And of course, that's sort of quite, uh, rather obvious. So what do we gain from an evolutionary approach to culture? You know, and here's a paper, you know, this, this 2008 paper by, by Aldrich et al, which I think I'm a co-author on and so is Jeff. Uh, uh, what it does, it's a it supplies a framework for explaining the evolution of, 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 of complex and undesigned historical outcomes. And, um, and I think that's, that it's why certain cultural beliefs adapt to changing circumstances and the elimination of others through processes of selection, which I'll say something about. And I think for an economic historian such as myself, and I haven't been able to convince a lot of colleagues of this, but I think I think it's true. The great advantage is that it's trying to explain why the present is the way it is and not some other possible way, you know, and it encourages to look at how the past shaped the present using Darwinian concept, particularly choices and selection and how these choices are being made and, and, and why. So let me now give you 
what I think the eight advantages of a Darwinian approach to economic history. I'll first go through the advantages sort of on a more abstract level. And then I'm going to try to give for each of them, I'll give you a sort of a brief application of how I think it would help us understand, particularly the era in which the book was interested in, which is sort of the, the, the two or three centuries before the Industrial Revolution. So roughly, you know, between uh, the invention of the of the printing press and say uh, 1750 or, or you know time like that. But the first advantage is that evolutionary systems are characterized by saying a fundamental duality of, of information and action. Okay, so it's essentially the duality between genotype and, and phenotype. Now these kind of distinctions are hazardous to extend to a cultural history, but you know I, I would say when all said and done, at the end of the day, you know, culture is about matters of the mind. And then these lead in some way to observable outcomes of both preferences and knowledge. And that's also from, you know, from, from, from one of Alex Masudi's papers. And so the mapping from beliefs to behavior is complicated. It isn't really any simpler than that from genes to phenotypes, which we know is, is, is far more complicated than anybody suspected when this literature first uh, 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 came about, okay? And there, there are many reasons why that should be so, why this complication occurs. I'll give you just one example. Uh, one can, for instance, speak of what, what you might call cultural pleiotropy, okay? Much like in evolutionary process. So a, a simple conceptual breakthrough can lead to multiple technological outcomes, okay? A good example is what we call in the history of technology, GPTs, general purpose technology. So there was a conceptual breakthrough of uh, electricity or at least self-exciting generators as they occurred in the late 1860s. And that led to a huge multiple uh, uh, um, set of technological outcomes in which electricity was applied to a whole bunch of other inventions, you know, from lighting to heating to transportation and on and on and on. That's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm thinking about here. Uh, Secondly, um, and this is something in which I, 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 I'm still very much uh, in the dark, but evolution is to some extent about the interaction between a pre-existing environment into which some kind of innovation is introduced and the innovation itself. So innovation remains even in a world of directed uh, research and stochastic variable. And so even if it's you know, not purely random, but it's still stochastic. Uh, we don't know precisely why a certain idea occurs to a certain individual um, and why in some societies certain ideas never occur at all. I always am able to entertain my undergraduates by telling them how it, it's possible that, you know, we have certain ideas that occurred later on. We don't know why they didn't occur uh, to anybody earlier. The example I always like to give here is, is the invention of eyeglasses, in, in which are invented in the in the 13th century. There's no evidence at all that in the you know in, during Greek and Roman times anybody ever came up with the idea. Yet they, they did have glass and they must have suffered from hyperopia. So it's not like there was no demand for it, there was no supply for it. Nobody ever thought of it. And so once people think about it, you know, everybody goes, wow, you know, that really worked. It, Wait, that kind of thing is hard to explain. There are many other examples that people come, uh, the history of technology literature is also, we don't know why that doesn't happen, um, uh, but it does. So, but clearly the likelihood of an idea occurring to anyone is affected by the environment and by perceived, perceived needs and by this kind of underlying knowledge. But I would say even if it were the case that the flow of innovations were wholly predictable, which it isn't, we still wouldn't be able to uh, predict its success unless we can somehow measure fitness, conditional and institutional environment. And most difficult, perhaps, is to take into account their feedback effect on the environment. So it isn't just that the environment, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by environment in a minute. It isn't just that the environment determines to, to, uh, the success of a certain innovation, but also the innovation does change the environment. And so um, and so that kind of feedback effect basically makes these things very difficult to predict, of course, as it is true in, in, in biology as well. 
So I already noted this uh, evolutionary systems are based on the dynamics produced by uh, superfecundity. Now, um, uh, as I already said, you know, the notion of natural selection in biological is, is purely metaphorical. Nobody actually does the selecting. Uh, but here we're really talking about people making conscious choices, choosing one cultural element over another from a menu of options. Okay, and so like, you know, a biological species, some ideas may go totally extinct in the face of a powerful new com competitor. So, you know, famous examples, of course, are say, like geocentric astronomy that, that went extinct, um, you know, after the you know, Galilean revolution, or humoral theories of disease, which went extinct in, in the late, uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century. Uh, but in other cases, new ideas may coexist with the old ones in some kind of, you know, mixed equilibrium in which the competitive environment is insufficiently stringent to bring about a complete domination of a, of a new invention, okay? That happens when I, and I, this is a term that I, I, I've used repeatedly, that is when, when knowledge is untight, that is, it's not very certain and not easily verifiable by the rhetorical criteria of the time. And so, you know, we still are living with that thing, you know, if you, for instance, look at the debate about uh, vaccination and you know, similar things. Finally, it's, so fourth, uh, evolutionary models, and this is a debate I'm, I'm certainly not going to get into, but there's a debate on whether, uh, whether evolution happens at different levels of selection, okay? So there's this big debate and, and uh, you know, a lot of people have written about this. Uh, but I would think that cultural, it, it is, there's not really much of a question that cultural evolution selection can happen at many levels. So uh, at one level, of course, within a given society, people pick ideas, you know, we're going to believe in this medicine, this agricultural technology or whatever. And if this is successful, the number of people in that society may increase simply because it increases their fitness. And so this thing, so you get selection of that society, and then of course you may it may spill over to other societies who who who, who mimic them, and and so on and so forth. So, uh, so so you can sort of see the selection happening at both the ideal and the populational level, and that's very much what what people who believe this in biology I think is happening there as well. Uh, fifth is resistance. So. This is something on which I've written in the past uh, quite a bit, and others have as well. Uh, uh, like all evolutionary systems, culture is resistant to change. You know, there are built-in mechanisms that prevent uh, 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 change at a certain level, and it creates, it gives the system uh, some measure of stability. Um, now, um, of course, the effectiveness of these mechanisms is itself a function of the content of the system. But, you know, cultural elements often form some kind of coherent system, and it will resist changes even if one of the components uh, becomes dubious simply because uh, it's interdependent with other components that people still, still have. And so what makes it even more complicated that in cultural system, you know, people uh, have what we would call cultural capital, okay? So people make investments in current beliefs and these investments might decline in value if the current beliefs were to be modified or overthrown. So, you know, again, I come back to this example of, of, of the development of, of the germ theory. So a whole bunch of doctors resisted it simply because they had gone to medical school and they learned miasmas and, and, and things like that. And now somebody comes and tells them, hey, everything you learn in medical school is wrong. Well, you're going to resist that simply because, <laughs> you know, your, your, your human capitalist is, is uh, tied up to that. So no matter what kind of cultural system we're looking at, there's always going to be some resistance to change and, and many seemingly fit innovations will, could fail in a um, hostile environment. I may come to the back to that, but this resistance to technological change, I've written some essays about this, and there's a recent book by uh, Calestis Yuma, which is uh, uh, not that recent anymore, but, but, but that discusses this in great detail. Now, where things get really hairy is um, about dynamics. And so almost any generalization of predictions about dynamics, uh, I think would be 
doomed. So there is a literature that feels that the definition of culture is that it moves very slowly at an almost tectonic pace and that it survives dramatic institutional and political shocks. But in fact, I think I can point to many cases, many of them, by the way, at our own time, in which culture changes relatively quickly and, and um, dramatically. And as a result of, um, you know, uh, some weakened resistance, perhaps, or perhaps some powerful exogenous shock that challenges existing cultural beliefs deeply. Um, you know, and we can think of all kinds of examples of that uh, in which, you know, something happened it makes culture change very rapidly. If you just think about this, hey, my own, our own experience in the United States in the last 20 years has been a radical change in people's attitudes uh, um, towards, say, certain drugs like marijuana, which is now available anywhere, whereas before you'd go, you'd go to jail for it because it was considered to be a taboo or people's... Um, uh, views about you know more uh, varied sexual behavior you know um, things like that um, culture has changed fairly rapidly you know and not, nothing uh, you think of the tectonic um, uh, and I think you know uh, Saviotti has a very nice discussion of that in a paper published a long time ago and of course there's the other thing is that uh, selectionist models stress that, that sometimes very rare events and unique action are amplified and cascade into, into quite radical changes in, 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 in outcomes. All right, so seven. Um, and this is, I think, a bit, a bit of a sort of more metaphysical, perhaps, way of thinking about it, but essentially this is the sort of neither fluke nor necessity argument. Um, so we, you know, the extremes of thinking about history in general are, on the one hand, a materialist analysis that basically thinks that historical outcomes are uh, inexorable, and a nihilist approach that sees nothing but randomness everywhere. And I think if you look at some of the great events of, of, of economic history that have you know, shaped our own time, in particular, of course, the great divergence between Europe and the rest of the world and the Industrial Revolution, uh, I would say they were neither a fluke in the sense that they were completely random, nor were they necessity in the sense that, uh, and I think uh, Gerard Vermeer has a very nice uh, statement uh, in, in his 2004 book in which he essentially says, look, comparative history helps us separate chance from necessity. And, um, and it's important, I think, for, and I'll keep telling that to my students, uh, and that is that not everything that happened had to happen. And even more important, lots of things that could have happened did not happen. And so that, I think, is something that if you really look at the past, is always worth uh, remembering. And I think the evolutionary approach, of course, gives you a very good clue to that. And finally, and this is the, you know, maybe the most controversial thing, is evolution progressive? And uh, well, you know, the question, of course, is what we mean by uh, by progressive. But you know, here is you know, for many, for instance, has clearly is clearly thinks that there is progress, whereas others like Futuyma and and Gold deny this. And I think almost everybody has an opinion about this, and I think the field is still to some extent uh, divided about this. All right. So that's the, those are the sort of eight ideas that I wanted to throw at you. And what I'm going to do now is sort of give you a little bit of a you know, a very superficial set of examples of how the economic history of Europe, uh, as I see it, between 1500 and 1750, can use these guidelines uh, to shed lights on it. Okay, so let me first uh, talk about duality. And so I make a distinction between what I call propositional knowledge, which is sort of vaguely akin to genetic information, and uh, techniques, which are sort of outcomes and therefore uh, can be seen as, as to some extent phenotypical. That is, analogy is not exact, but it's still clear that in this period, what happens is that there is a set of mutations, which you could think of as a scientific revolution. Uh, many of the insights of the methods that, 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 that were generated by it um, 
did create help or helped create the industrial revolution so this is too controversial and uh, particularly the physics that was created by galileo and, and and newton wasn't weren't all that useful in in the industrial revolution as, as i think we all know but you know some techniques were dependent on advances in knowledge or if you want the genotypes above all of course steam power which did require at least the discovery of atmospheric pressure and the uh, possibility of, an, of a vacuum, as well as all kind of knowledge about the expansions, expansive properties of steam and so on and so forth. So many minor and not so minor advance, advances in knowledge that we date to the Industrial Revolution aided in the rise of productivity. You think of chlorine bleaching, you think of gaslighting. I mean, I could make more, give you more examples, but you basically get the idea. Even so, some of the other techniques essentially were completely orthogonal to advances in, in, in science. But what happens, I think, and this is the more, I think, interesting part, is that, is that what happens in this period, you that what's created is a positive feedback loop uh, in which technology feeds back into science and science feeds back in technology and so you think about inventions that are really in part of the sort of world of, of prescriptive knowledge you think what the telescope did for astronomy and the microscope for biology and in our own age of course lasers and computers and all kind of other technologies that actually feed back into creation of more knowledge and then that knowledge is then created used to create more uh, more technology and so on so that's the kind of insight that we get from duality and i think that is actually arguably quite valuable and secondly i want to talk a little bit about the environment i waved I used to hand waving when i talked about the environment but basically i think the environment in which in the innovations were generated is determined in large part by what we call institutions and you know which you know that the literature on institutions of course has has blossomed in the last decades thanks to the you know pioneering work of many people including jeff uh, here as well but of course originally doug north and abner greif and asimoglu all, a whole bunch of literature has been talking about institutions so some institutions of course are repressive and reactionary and others were progressive and, and encourage innovation but here too i think there is a two-way interaction in which innovations affect the institutional environment and in the institutional environment affects innovations and the feedback here could be either positive or negative and um, it's so very hard to know precisely to what extent this will ever reach some kind of an uh, of an e e equilibrium but essentially institutions constrain human behavior and actions but they can also be affected by the outcomes and so um you know this i think is is an, an area of, of of research in which we're just really starting to scratch the the, uh, the 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 surface so here's an institution that my book focuses on which is um uh, which i think mattered a great deal at the time so we think of course as of markets as selection mechanisms and one market that is the sort of the mother of all selection mechanisms is what we call a competitive market for ideas and um, in which you know intellectuals and scientists and physicians and even some artisans they get you know f confronted with a menu and, they, and they're supposed to choose now this is also obviously not totally conscious but it's there and many of these menus of the items of the menus i'm sorry many of these items on those menus are mutually exclusive you can't really choose both copernican or ptolemaic cosmo cosmography or both galenian or any other chemical medicine or you couldn't be both a calvinist and a catholic right i mean that's kind of obvious and so the market for ideas <laughs> excuse me uh, at its time rested on this institution which uh, is known as the republic of letters which is just a virtual community that, that that writes the rules for you know how uh intellectual innovations are being generated and how they're being diffused but above all how they're being selected and so what we know is that this intellectual elite or this upper tail human capital i talked about earlier how they informed each other and tried to persuade each other and of course the mechanisms are, are well known you know, there's there's a whole bunch of epistolary networks in which people wrote each other letters there's proliferation of books and pamphlets uh, there are there's a whole competitive system of universities 
and so on and so forth. So these are all the kind of things that make the markets for ideas work. And that's the main institutions by which to reach selection operate. So how then are things being selected? And um, that's, I think, the, the sort of the hardest question of them all, perhaps. Um, the selection criteria really are far from simple, and there isn't really, a, I think, a, a, a coherent theory of what we mean by, uh, by fitness. But we, what we can say, of course, is that the, the uh, way in which ideas were selected by philosophers, whether they were intellectual, natural philosophers, or medical doctors, or whatever, and I think there are sort of three uh, uh, things that, that, that happen at this time. Okay, The first is the growth of the use of mathematics, in which people you know, make other people see that they are right or persuade them because they can, uh, because they're about mathematics, there really isn't really much of a, of a, of a, of a debate. The second is the growing, legit sorry to change the order here, the growing legitimacy of experimental work. Of course, that goes back all the way to sort of to Francis Bacon and, and other people who are writing about the methodology of, 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 pro of scientific progress. And, you know, Aristotle famously sort of delegitimized experimental work, also not every medieval scientist listened to him. Uh, but still, you know, experiments become more and more central and clearly become a, a main way in which people uh, try to uh, persuade each other. And finally, of course, there's just this sort of almost mindless, you know, inductive em cataloging of empirical regularity, hoping in the best traditions of Francis Bacon that you see some kind of patterns there. So, you know, sometimes you, people do and sometimes they don't, but that's how people collect, you know, collecting data. But these are all rhetorical criteria, that's to say, the means of persuasion. So if I can persuade you, okay, you can select the idea that I'm proposing to you. And so I, the term that I use for this is tightness. So the more persuasive and verifiable an idea, the greater its tightness. And I have no illusion, of course, that there are, that everybody's always convinced, but you know, the number of members of the Flat Earth Society is, I think, extremely low, and the people who deny uh, uh, you know, the germ theory of, of, of disease is probably, you know, minimal and so on and so forth. So some of these ideas have become quite tight and have become almost generally accepted, if not by everybody. And sometimes they're not, you know, and via the, 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 the debates was between, you know, pro-vaxxers and anti-vaxxers in the last uh, couple of years, and you get sort of an idea. And so it's important, however, to point out that not all choices or not all ideas that had fitness in the market for ideas actually added fitness to the population. That's sort of a complication that we have to admit. Ideas are sometimes picked even so uh, they are, you know, by our standards at least, bogus. Okay, so you think about oh, medical innovators such the great medical innovators like Paracelsus in the 16th century and Van Helmont a century later and you basically you know, I hate to put it this way but these ideas were basically bogus and they resulted in harmful harmful practice particularly you know the use of mercury as a sort of you know, uh, med medication you know other crazy ideas similar you know you think about things like phlogiston chemistry or Cartesian physics you know these were selected and eventually they were unselected but not before they were uh, 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 quite widely adopted and clearly the tightness of the alternatives uh, uh, took a while to, to fully materialize. Now, in other cases, uh, uh, ideas could, uh, were tight. So for instance, the existence of the new world uh, in the beginning of the 16th century which still did, was still disputed, but sooner or later people realized hey, there, there, there is a continent there. Or you look at something very different, which is sort of like the computational power of logarithms, okay, invented by Napier famously in 1614. You know, I mean, that's the kind of thing where, you know, I can show it to you, this works. You know? <laughs> so, so how are you going to, you know, nobody's going to dispute that. So I would say in general, in fields where mathematics was decisive, and that includes, of course, Co Copernicus's view of the solar system or Newtonian mechanics, knowledge is reasonably tight and these selections uh, uh, were fairly easy to make. In other cases, it takes 
a long time, in particular, I would say, in medicine, you know, knowledge was famously untied before the 19th century, and there are all kind of crazy ideas and crazy practices running around. Okay, levels of selection. So this takes us a little bit to sort of global global uh, history. Uh, uh, one way of thinking about this is look at at, fit, at at the success of the West, however you know you define the West, and um, and realize that for you know the fact that they selected certain scientific principles and technological innovations created a process that gave them material superiority over other parts of the world that allowed it to dominate and exploit it in all kinds of ways and, and forms, and so you know. Despite the fact that I open myself to, you know, uh, Eurocentric or triumphalist um, accusations, there's no arguing with success, you know, much of the non-European world eventually adopted some modified, perhaps some qualified version of Western science and medicine and the techniques based on them, okay? And the paradoxical thing, and the one that I think we need all to think about long and hard is that this did not lead to the kind of demographic consequences that both Darwin and Malthus would have expected because it turns out that as people pick better and better ideas, one of the ideas that they pick is how not to reproduce themselves that, that rapidly. And of course, that has led to the sharp decline in fertility, which is, you know, uh, Charles Darwin and, 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 and Thomas Malthus would never have expected. And yet, you know, the, uh, the fact that that the rest of the world had to, uh, in order to survive, had to adopt these innovations that were originated in, in, in the West. So those that did copy and imitate these cultural features and, you know, Japan after the Meiji Revolution, of course, is the classic example. They, they thrive and thus they demonstrate in some sense the fitness of these ideas that they expanded numerically, and of course, eventually Japan's success convinced the Chinese that, that this was, the way, this was uh, uh, the way to go. What is interesting, of course, isn't just science and technology that they uh, adopt, but a whole bunch of other Western culture features like dress and languages and uh, religion and even Western music, you know, so that, that, that seems to be uh, um, you know, one measure of, of fitness. Okay, resistance. So, as I said, um, um, there's always there's a lot of literature about resistance to new technology and and, and uh, to new science. Um, now, this resistance has, I think, maybe justifiably, been regarded as a positive factor that maintains some measure of stability and and coherence. You know, without that, it couldn't it couldn't function because a lot of the proposed innovations. Um, that pop up in books, newspapers, you know, internet, social media. And they are not some, there are various levels of, sort of mistakes or misinformation or fake news, and they need to be resisted as being wrong. And yet, at the same time, if you have too much resistance, you may end up, you know, leading to a world that's static and stagnation, and you may block welfare improving innovations of high fitness, as in fact is, is the case in many historical societies. And so everything depends here on, on tightness. How do we tell the difference between fake news and, and true news? And that's, of course, in many cases, very hard. But there are times, as I said, in, in, in the case of mathematics, in which you can sort of prove or disprove things. But there are other cases in which it works well. I always like the famous example of Isaac Cosebon, you know, who basically showed that uh, the writings of, of this sort of fake philosopher called Hermes Trismegistus, uh, which led to this sort of quasi-religion called Hermeticism, that this is bogus, you know, the guy was basically a sense of forgeries. But you think about, you know, Lavoisier's, you know, dramatic demonstration that phlogiston chemistry was erroneous and, and, and essentially uh, uh, laying the foundations of modern chemistry. So just briefly, you know, resistance has, of course, two levels, okay? The first level is, is that people will resist innovation for selfish reason because of this, as I said, investment in, in human capital. And I'm always sort of uh, cite this, 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 this famous statement by Max Planck saying that science advances one funeral at a time, which is kind of, I think, clever. 
Uh, but on the macro level, society may set up institutions that resist change and protect stability at all costs, threatening society with stasis. You know, you think about the Holy uh, Inquisition in Europe or the Chinese imperial examination system, which I uh, have written about. All right. Now, what about dynamics? And so, uh, <laughs> in the culture, in the context of culture and science and technology and sort of things that we, that we would think of as ideas, it's sort of hard to deny whether it exists in, in, in nature or not, I don't know. And the, the debate is still very much open, but I still remember re reading Richard Goldsmith's 1940 book on, on hopeful monstrosity, what he calls, in which he talks about you know, these discrete mutations that may create a line of, of a distinct species that occupies a, sort of a different ecological niche. And whether we see them in nature or not, uh, particularly, I would think, early modern Europe was really rich in these sort of hopeful cultural monstrosities that were in, in many ways a discrete leap and significantly different from what was there before and really had cascading evolutionary consequences in cultural uh, domains. So to be selected, as I said, they had to compete in this market for ideas. And of course, many of these things are scientific, uh, uh, but they're not all scientific. You think about the forensic, the Reformation itself, of course, uh, or the Great Voyages, which are, are in some sense discrete events, as we still teach them. But also, you know, other things that aren't necessarily scientific. You think about, for instance, the invention of perspective and paintings, which is attributed to Brunelleschi in the uh, early 15th century. But you think about two centuries later, but sort of Spinoza's revolutionary philosophical system, these are radical departures of what we had before. And so they would qualify as, as goldsmiths, as uh, hopeful monstrosities. Um, uh, and so in technology itself, of course, the uh, um, certain useful uh, uh, forms of useful knowledge uh, uh, created abrupt and discrete changes, you know, and 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 that then affect uh, 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 the system so that it helps create even more hopeful monsters. Another case of, of of positive feedback, and so I would think, you know, the two most famous books at all uh, of the time that we should think of as 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 hopeful monstrosities, as, as the is Copernicus's uh, the revolutionibus and Newton's Principia. But you know, I could make this list uh, a great deal longer. You know, like Galileo's Dialogo, you know, Gilbert's the Magnet, or even Paracelsus' uh, uh, the Großen Wundertsnei, which is you know uh, uh, this massive attack on on Galilean uh, 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 medicine. And so you think about also about new instruments coming online, microscope, telescope, vacuum pumps, you know, thermometers, all kinds of things that, that, that are quite discontinuous. All right. Now, contingency. And, you know, here is the question about um, are these changes deterministic or are they sort of inexorably decreed by historical uh, forces? And, you know, uh, I think evolutionary theory is always allowed for contingency, right? I mean, nobody would <laughs> deny that the evolutionary history uh, of this planet was altered, you know, dramatically by the great asteroid that his uh, Chisholm, I, I, it's hard to pronounce, on, on the Yucatan Peninsula, we all know this at the end of the Cretaceous, right? So this is what, you know, got rid of the dinosaurs, you know, well, every high school kid knows this. The historical equivalent of devastating asteroids were the Mongols. Uh, and so wherever the Mongols invaded, uh, you look at China, or India, Middle East, you know, these places are a bit different, but they basically left economies in ruins for generations and may have set back the process of economic development permanently. And it was by and large a matter of luck that when the Mongols invade Europe in 1241, they left a path of other destruction wherever they went in Croatia, Hungary, and Poland, and even eastern parts of Eastern Germany. But then all of a sudden, for reasons that aren't quite clear, but probably have to do with internal politics, they withdrew and back to Mongolia and never came back. And so Europe was saved uh, by this uh, set of, of events. And so it's fair to say, I think, that in general, the institutional outcomes, the uh, 
the environment in which things happen has a large aleatory component, okay? And they are the results of, of battles, of dynastic arrangements, of power struggles, you know, or, you know, the arbitrary preference of some individuals, you know, like the division of, 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 of Korea into, you know, Northern and Southern or Germany into Eastern and Western, things like that. And I would all say that there's also nothing inevitable in the survival of relatively tolerant and enlightened institutions in, say, the low countries in Britain in the 17th century, which are thought to be, you know, instrumental in bringing about economic progress. And so uh, 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 one could make fairly minor rewrites of history that would have secured, an, 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 say, an obscurantist Catholic regimes in which the Republic of Letters it would have turned um, into some kind of benighted theocracy that's dominated by reactionary Jesuits. You know, so there's a very nice novel by Kingsley Amis uh, called The Alteration, in which he sort of imagines this, this, this world in which it's ruled by, by these uh, reactionary uh, Catholics. And in such a world, I would think that, you know, certainly the most radical thinkers or out of the box thinkers like Newton and Spinoza and all the way to sort of, you know, John Toland and Lamentri and so on, they would have been either silenced or sufficiently discouraged and something that, that we'd recognize as the Enlightenment may never have taken off. And so the lesson is clear, you know, not everything that happened had to happen and beware hindsight bias. And finally, progress, you know, and um, does evolution lead to something that we might uh, progress. And so I, I wouldn't venture an opinion if this happened in evolutionary biology, where sort of the giants disagree. Uh, but I would say this, um, one can think of progress in a particular dimension, even if it doesn't affect other dimensions. So you think of something like Cope's rule, which says basically that organisms have a built-in tendency to get larger. I understand it's not entirely uncontroversial, but certainly when I learned this stuff, it seemed to be more or less correct. And so this is particularly true when innovations are not random, but directed toward material problems, because of course, uh, scientific and technological knowledge is uh, in some sense cumulative, which is sort of indicates that the progress would be, would be inevitable. And so um, I think in history, we see a trend toward progress and growth as it becomes more and more pronounced in the 18th century. Um, but, um, and so material life, I think, clearly is uh, subject to progress. But in other dimensions, it, it, this is less, much less clear. So I think it's fair to say that progress in one dimension does not imply progress in other dimensions. So I would venture that institutions uh, in many ways have failed to get much better since uh, 1500. You know, there have been times in which, in which it seemed so, but as we all know, there have been serious setbacks in the institutional quality of the world in the 1920s and 1930s, and I'm afraid to say it, but it's probably true in our own time as well. And um, I don't think of it as we have a very good uh, evolutionary model of institutional growth. I mean, we have attempts in that direction, but uh, um, fitness and, and selection here involves a great deal of control and power by a relatively small group and the use of violence and basically, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the all bets are off and, and how that's happening. So I'm, I'm starting to run up out of time and I still have quite a few things I wanted to talk about. So I maybe just want to very briefly go through Sort of what I call these uh, these so-called biases, and um, it's a term I borrowed from from Rob Boyd. But um, essentially, what I mean by is this: so the default option for any individual to pick up, you know, cultural features is that they follow their parents and they're sort of what I call semi-parents or teachers and other people that the parents select. And that means that if your, if your parents are Catholic, and you, you know, the high, there's a high probability that you'll be a Catholic. And if your parents are, um, you know, communist, you know, you're more likely to be communist. Although I don't know if that's the case, but, uh, but, but you, you can see what I'm saying. But 
that's the default option. But you can choose your mind and be persuaded, you know. And as a Catholic, you can become a Jew, or you Jew, you become a Catholic, or you know, uh, uh, whatever. So people pick up variants over their lifetime, and the question is, uh, how? What do we know about these biases? So in the book, I make I make a list of sort of eight or nine, sorry, nine biases. So there's all kind of the biases, and I'm not going to get into in, in too much of the, the detail here, but uh, these are all ways of, of thinking about why culture moves in this direction. So uh, let me just go briefly through this list and then basically I wind things up. Okay, so one of them is uh, obviously content bias. So you know, is the new information I'm exposed with right or wrong? Okay, and that depends, of course, on 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 tightness and on rhetorical criteria. So, you know, uh, if somebody tells me, look, you were wrong about this particular thing that you thought, and here is the proof of, of, of the opposite, you know, um, that may be sufficient. More likely, however, is what I call direct bias, which essentially, I don't actually check if it's correct. There's some authority that tells me that, you know, drinking red wine is good for me or, you know, vaccinating myself against COVID works and things like that. Okay? Then there are these biases of confirmation and consistencies in which uh, essentially I, I come, somebody comes up with a new idea that's perfectly, you know, uh, consistent with what I already believe. So I tend to accept it simply because it could, you know, it, in some sense it confirms what I already thought. There is what calls model race based bias, which is a bit like direct bias, but it's, it's because, you know, basically you imitate role models, so it's sort of be like Mike kind of thing. Um, then there is just rhetorical bias. So it's persuasiveness, not on the basis of being right, but simply through rhetorical bias. As you think about, you know, people who have been particularly effective in uh, communicating their ideas, you know, Marx would be, you know, maybe maybe a good exa example. Then there's a frequency dependence. So um, if conformism, I, I will adopt a new idea if I see everybody else uh, believing it. There is the what I call the rationalization bias, which is that if there are certain norms that already exist, I'm going to try to tailor my beliefs to internalize these norms. So, for instance, if there is a law that says that you know uh, smoking hashish is prohibited, then I will be more amenable to a, a cultural belief that says, yeah, this stuff is really bad for you simply because it's prohibited. There's coercion bias which is essentially, you know, believe this or I should kind of thing, uh, which we saw, of course, in, in the Soviet Union and in communist countries a great deal. And we see in places like, like Iran, I would say it rarely works very well forcing people to believe things, but, you know, there are some evidence that there are things in terms. And finally, there is salient event bias in which if something really catastrophic happens, people may change their beliefs, but it has to be truly catastrophic. So the Black Death is a, is a case in point, but I would point to things like the Holocaust, for instance, as having changed a lot of people's beliefs simply because, you know, uh, and it's, it's not obvious in what direction, but if something like this could happen, uh, then maybe what I believe previously isn't quite right, and I, I may change uh, my beliefs. So what this list really tells you is that any kind of simple, one line theory that tells you uh, how to use uh, uh, these models and to make any kind of predictions uh, uh, is, is probably doomed. And in, in a way, I think that is where the great value of evolutionary theory is. It doesn't really make uh, predictions. It really just is based on uh, trying to understand the past in a somewhat more organized way. Uh, maybe I will leave it at that, at that. And, you know, thank you very much. I'm sure people have all kinds of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Joel. That was fantastic and really interesting. Um, anyone like to ask a question? Any questions? Marion Blute seems to be on. Marion Blute, yes, Marion, please. Marion, can you hear me? Um, I, I really enjoyed your talk, and I always enjoy it when a historian of some particular stuff actually takes Darwinian cultural evolutionary theory seriously. 
that's really, uh, to me, that's the wonderful thing. And there was one thing I was wondering, though, are you familiar with the work of George Basala? Because I always enjoyed it yeah, on the evolution of technology. Right on my shelf. Of course I am, yes. And yeah. it's been quite a while since you wrote that book, but it helped inspire me in thinking about how evolutionary models should be applied uh, uh, to technology. I, I, I think slightly different because I'm trained as an economist and, you know, you can't can't get it out of your system once it's in there but and and he's trained as a historian so we do think slightly different about about things but i think there's a lot of commonalities there about how sort of technology can be seen as an evolutionary process in which one technique uh, uh, is derived from another so i'm uh, thanks thanks for pointing that out and I, yeah. it's been actually as i write up this lecture i may i may have to reread that book because i it's been quite a while since i I've read it. I think I've read it twice. He's and a historian it, of technology. Yeah, I know. I, I, I've never met him, but but I, I do know his work quite well. And that, that's that's in many ways, you know, a seminal book that I that I admire a great deal. But so thanks for bringing that up, Marion. Let me just add. Can I add one more question? Yes, of uh, course. About uh, where that was I. Um, about the business that there's no nothing from biological evolutionary theory that gives us the answer to the question of what is fit and fitness and so on. That's true at the time of Darwin and so on, but evol biological evolutionary theory has moved on and has added a lot. So there's a lot of literature, uh, biological evolutionary literature on things like density dependence and evolutionary ecology in general, on what ecological circumstances favor what kinds of things. And social evolution and many of those principles can quite possibly be applied to cultural evolution or other forms of cultural evolution to stand to state it so 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 so, so blandly i mean I'm, I'm i'm fully aware of that and it's it's quite clear and i have actually written about this that you know there are certain uh, environments which of which i think as 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 institutional arrangements that may or may not favor the fitness of certain activities. I, you know, I give you one example, which I've been long involved in, and that is, you know, um, one set of institutions that's really critical to the rate of change is intellectual property rights. So economists know that uh, when you come up with new knowledge, I mean, there is sort of a fundamental market failure in the sense that this is a classic public good. You know, once you've got the, the, the idea, it doesn't cost you to give it to anybody else. And it's hard to protect others from using it. So owning a new idea is very hard and therefore uh, rewarding somebody who comes up with a new idea is equally hard. And uh, one of the things that I've been worried about a great deal is how do we incentivize people to be innovators because we don't, you know, because they can't own a new idea the way you can you know, add a cow or, you know, a, a piece of land or a house or anything like that. And this is something that uh, some environments have done much better than others. Uh, for instance, in the West, the idea of intellectual property rights and of patents or, or other rewards for innovation starts popping up in the late 15th century. And it becomes more and more formalized until the French Revolution basically spreads the patent system with everybody. The Chinese never had a system of intellectual property rights until they learned it from the West. Um, and I think even today, the notion that people own intellectual properties doesn't come natural to them, which is why they keep stealing Western uh, Western technology, not thinking that this is in some sense immoral or criminal. And I think that's, that's, that's the kind of fitness that I think uh, uh, would be perfectly suitable is the kind of thing that, that you're talking about, Marion, because we uh, uh, because we can think of environment in which innovations are, uh, are you know, are, are more likely to occur and therefore uh, give, give, you know, provide greater fitness. Um, so, you know, th th that kind of institutional environment is what I, what I think about all the time, because that's what economic historians really do. Uh, you you mentioned conformity, for example, positive frequency dependence, but yes. probably, but certainly biologically and probably also in economics, I would think negative frequency dependence is just as common. That is, it's or more common. It's 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 advantageous to do the opposite of what the majority is doing in order to reduce competition. Yes, 
yes and no, depending very much on the technique in question. So it's in, in, in any sort of uh, econo technology that has network externalities, for instance, okay, uh, frequency dependence is almost likely to be positive, okay? So you and I need to have, you know, the same kind of, of uh, a communication technology if we're going to talk on the phone or if we're going to, you know, email each other. In other cases, there's negative frequency dependence. You're absolutely right. You're just crowding out. I mean, uh, um, there's no, there's no, you know, uh, uh, obvious, you know, uh, tight rule about that. So I, uh, that's, what, that's what, and I think that that's true in nature as well. You know, um, there's a certain critical mass that any species have to attain if they're going to survive. You know, if there's too few of them, uh, they will they will disappear. But if there are too many of them, uh, that may there, there may be congestion. So uh, probably we are looking at here at a sort of a highly non uh, monotonic relationship between the number of people uh, that are subscribing to a certain thing. But in other cases, you know, there is clearly something like a, a, a consensus really matter. I mean, in, a, in an ideal world, that I would think of, you know, everybody would get vaccinated against COVID, and uh, uh, and uh, and clearly there's there's there's, there's positive uh, value. Well, thank, to... you. thank you for a great talk, and I'll give other people a chance. Sure. Thank, thank you, thank you Marion. Thank you, Joel. Um, Peter Merman. Ah, Peter Merman. How are you, Peter? I'm good. Hi, Joel. A former colleague. Yeah. Joel, I wanted to ask you a little bit more. Um, you spoke in the beginning that you think that you haven't had much influence on other economic historians. Can you spell out a bit more why that be, would be so? Because my perception was, at least in the domain of uh, technological history, right, after and a constant published, you know, um, his book on the turbojet revolution, right? In in technological history, right? Evolutionary ideas spread quite a bit. So if you could shed a little bit more light why they haven't spread in economic history would be my question. Well, I would mention uh, a book sitting on my shelf about the German chemical industry in the late 19th century that you may be <laughs> vaguely familiar with, yeah. uh, which, which has the same kind of, yeah, no, no. I mean, I think, it's not like it's been completely ineffective. I think within my narrow community of uh, economic history, it really hasn't had the kind of impact that I would have thought. I mean, you are really looking a little bit outside of, you know, people like Abe Constant and, you know, Peter Moorman and other people using these, uh, using these ideas, they are being quite influential, but I think more so in Europe, by the way, than in, than in, in the US for some reason. But I think in the wider field of economic history, you know, looking at my, my colleagues, my students, things like that, within an economics department, this really hasn't caught on. And I think the number of Citation, say to uh, Nelson and Winter. I give you one one example. It's been going down in the last few years. That influence really seems to have peaked, you know, maybe a decade ago, and seems to be on, on uh, waning now. And uh, you know, it, this has to do with, I think, to some extent, with the sociology of science, but also I think with the kind of new uh, new ideas that have been coming around in economic history, which are mostly sort of highly empirical data-based kind of things in which people worry a great deal more about, you know, um, identification issues and other sort of, you know, econometric questions and not so much about the wider context of things. I, I have hoped that that will change, Peter, because uh, I think culture has made an entrance into economic history and you know there's a whole sort of growing body of of people trying to quantify culture measure it through you know natural language processing and other techniques so i, I have some hopes there but i would say just looking at the journals you know the, uh, uh, whether they are you know, field journals in economic history or general journals in, in economics I see very little, just in terms of you look at the citations and you look at the at the at, at the words that are being used. I see very little influence of of Darwinian models to date, and um, you know, you and I are doing our best to change that. But it's you know, it's it's a, maybe it's a hopeful monster, Peter, <laughs> but it hasn't fully evolved from its eggs yet. Okay, Peter, thank you. Um, thanks, Joe.
Uh, there's no ha other hand up for the moment, but uh, can I ask a quick question myself? Yes, um, of course. It's, it's, it's just a little, little, a very tiny nitpick, or query even, it's not even a nitpick. It, it, that is your use of the word Lamarckian, okay? I, I, I think it's fine. Um, I, I can see what you're saying, but there's kind of health warnings here. Well, health warning number one, is that a lot of people dichotomize Darwinism and Lamarckism. They say social evolution is not Darwinian, it's Lamarckian. Now, that dichotomy, I think, is false. I agree. Um, you can comment on that in your own view, but I think it's false because Darwin, Darwinism is more general. And if Lamarckism was true in any context, it would need Darwin, Darwinism. Uh, Rick, Richard Dawkins made that point uh, 40 years ago. The other, the other reason is that Darwin himself was Lamarckian. I mean, he didn't know anything about genes, as you know, and about genetic selection or DNA. All that came much later. And he actually used Lamarckian mechanisms of inheritance of acquired characteristics in his theory. And in fact, he used them more and more. Um, in fact, the later editions of the origin are more replete with these than the first edition, perhaps to its disadvantage as a book. Um, the other reason is, and this was pointed out by David Hull, is that we have to be careful when we use the word Lamarckism, we just simply say blandly it's inheritance of acquired characteristics. And he, he makes a useful distinction or useful metaphor. He says, what about a dog catching fleas from another dog? It, or a, a puppy catching fleas from its parents? Is that the inheritance of acquired characteristics? No, it isn't because what must be involved in a, a meaningful sense of this use of the word is some uh, implantation or some change from, from the parents to the puppy of its genetic system, of its inheritance system. So when it occurs in social evolution or cultural evolution, it can't just simply be in one culture looking like another and passing on characteristics. That's not enough for it to be Lamarckian. It must also have some effect on the cultural genotype, whatever that is. Use that, use that term yourself. So we can use that as a metaphor. So there are cultural genotypes, which may be sort of core, habitual, triggerable responses and so on, rather than the phenotypes. And it's the effect on the genotypes which is necessary to make it in some meaningful sense Lamarckian. So I, I personally, I'm not uh, saying you have to remove the word, but I, I would be much more cautious in using it in this context. So that's over to you to comment. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think you're, you're totally right, of course, that Darwin himself was a Lamarckian and that this, this sort of dichotomization between, uh, quote, Darwinianism and Lamarckianism really is neo-Darwinian, if you yeah, want, sort of post-1920 right. or something like that. And yeah. I, maybe that's the, term, that's the term I should have used, and I, I, I really couldn't agree with you more. It's also quite interesting, uh, um, of course, to 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 realize that even as we as we have learned in the last ten or fifteen years, the sort of Weismannian barrier, uh, which was supposed to sort of you know, defend us against Lamarckianism, is actually much more porous than we saw it uh, uh, going to be, and that our whole way of thinking about it. So this, this is, was a, maybe an ill-chosen uh, rhetorical convention that I use Lamarckian and I, 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 I apologize, but it, it does communicate particularly with people who, you know, and who haven't read the works of my much lamented former colleague David Hull, who, as you know, taught philosophy here at Northwestern, and I knew him well. And uh, and I actually learned that from David. I remember him telling me this. What he just told me over over lunch when we had a one of our many conversations, which really set my, my my wheels going on this. And you're you're absolutely totally right. And I, I, I but but you know there is in the in the more general public, and I include I, I, I hate to say it, you know, most of my uh, 
economist colleagues in that general public, there is still a belief that this distinction is valid, that you have the Darwinian things which only pass through the genes and Lamarckian things which are acquired yeah. characteristics. And, and so in this, in this, for this audience, I maybe should have expressed myself a, a little bit more careful and, you know, point well taken, uh, Jeff. Thanks, thanks Joel. Uh, Dermot, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come in? Yeah, thanks very much, Jeff. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm picking up a little bit on, on something you said earlier. Uh, thinking about the, the scientific process as an evolutionary, the advancement of scientific knowledge as an evolutionary process. There was a paper that's come out in Nature last week that shows that the uh, disruptive or innovative nature of, of scientific publications across all disciplines um, has uh, reduced dramatically over the last 50 years. So not just in social science, but across all the sciences. Uh, and if we think about that sort of development of scientific knowledge as an evolutionary process, I was be interested to in know what you think could be the reasons for this, you know, the reasons that the authors uh, put forward are that uh, scientific knowledge is becoming more fragmented, more discipline specific with less uh, you know, focusing on more narrow, uh, you know, definitions of what uh, of what what their domains are in each of their scientific areas, but um, clearly, from an evolutionary perspective, there might be other explanations here. Yeah, I mean, I I, I didn't see the science paper, but I saw the Economist had a little, little thing about it. Uh, uh, last week, in which they basically, put, I think this has to do with sort of citation, the, the, the mechanism of citation, right? That's the, is, is, is that the paper you're talking about, in which people look, when they actually measure to what extent a paper that cites you also cites the people that you yourself cited. Is that is that the paper you're talking about? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Um, and yeah, I, mean, I thought that was that was quite interesting. Um, I'm not totally sure what it means, and I think the authors themselves, at least as far as I could read the account of the economy, they don't really say, look, we're running out of really great ideas. It has much more to do, I think, with one point that it probably has to do with, and this is uh, something that uh, my colleague Benjamin Jones has, has, has written about, which is that the, sort of the burden of knowledge has gotten much larger in the sense that in every field, the amount of literature that you have to control and know is 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 growing, uh, which is one reason why people actually produce their best work uh, as they get older and older, because, you know, they have to study longer before they can actually achieve any kind of st stature in their in their um, profession. So what Ben shows, for instance, is that, you know, it, that it used to take about four years to get a PhD in the beginning of the 20th century. And now it takes at least six. And then there's, in most fields, there's another five or even 10 years of postdoc in which you still continue to be trained. And so the, the amount of stuff that you have to know is, is, uh, is much larger. And I think that may well be one of the things that is, that's driving this, uh, this mechanism. Uh, I'm not worried, um, uh, as some people might be, that the world is running out of sort of great new ideas. In fact, um, I would I would point to a, a a a quite famous paper that was published oh maybe twenty years ago by a now deceased economist Martin Weizmann. And what Weizmann showed in that argued in that paper is that a great deal of scientific progress is actually recombinations. He used the term recombinations of previous knowledge and that as the set of ideas keeps growing the number of recombination actually increases combinatorically which is faster than exponentially and so actually the number of ideas that are going to be feasible in every society keeps growing at an absolutely dazzling rate and uh, but of course what will happen is that most of these ideas will not be entirely sort of uh, novel in the sense that they don't contain uh, uh, elements of previous ideas, but that they recombine them in in novel ways. And, you know, you could argue that much scientific and technological progress actually consists of recombining existing components in novel ways. I'm not sure that that explains everything, but there's a, there's a lot to that, of course. 
And if that's the case, I think that would be perfectly consistent what this this paper is is showing. In fact, it's 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 what you ought to expect. Uh, that said, uh, I know, and maybe this is not what you asked, but I, I need to get this out of my system. Uh, so there's a big debate between me and my illustrious colleague Robert Gordon, uh, a very well respected and known economist, about you know, essentially is. Are most of the great inventions already there and have all the low hanging fruits been picked and, and so on and so forth. And I, I remain an, an optimist about this. I think, in fact, the new, the, the, uh, the existing uh, 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 or the, the forthcoming supply of new radical ideas is going to expand, maybe not at the fact, quite as fast as Weizmann thought, but fast. And the main reason I think that is because, it, uh, and this is something I, I, I mentioned briefly, but I didn't really talk about it a lot, is that there, is there, what really counts in, in um, the evolution of knowledge is the feedback effect between the tools that we do, that we have science, we do science and the science itself. And I think the advent of lasers and computers in the last 30 years has been radical, but I think the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning as kind of, you know, super research assistants uh, will make the progress of science much faster. I don't know exactly what direction it will go to, but, you know, the applications of artificial intelligence, particularly in the last a year or two, really, uh, to science have been absolutely dazzling. And it may, you know, how that is going to evolve, Durban, I, I don't know, and neither does anybody else. But, but I think we're really standing on the verge of a new era in which, which may be akin to the sort of scientific revolution of the of the 17th century, or the sort of great quantum revolution of the beginning of the 20th century, in which totally new things uh, will be revealed to us thanks to improved tools. And um, and I think that is something that fills me with both a great deal of hope and a great deal of fear, <laughs> for all the obvious reasons. Thank you. Sorry, that's a wonderful note to begin to conclude, um, a note of optimism. Um, we had a talk a few months ago about John Gowdy, and he, he used um, uh, uh, examples from ant communities and so on to give us a very pe pessimistic view oh, about God. human evolution, which I, which I found really quite um, grueling to uh, accommodate, but I think your optimistic view is a nice uh, counterblast to that. Um, by the way, we mentioned uh, machine learning, Joel. Um, th th there's some, I don't know if you've known some interesting work going on in economic history using legal texts. Uh, um, John Graal and, and uh, Peter Graal and Peter Murrow are doing work like that, and um, I think that's going to have a big effect on economic history. And, so perhaps it will be soon, not long before there's a few more Darwinian economic historians around, and that will be a great outcome. Um, Dermot, a quick favour, could you put that reference on to nature on the chat so people like me can find it? That would be great. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, we've run out of time, but uh, it's been a fantastic hour and a half. So the, the, your talk was fun, really, really very, very interesting, and I think... Um, the realization that it's revolutionized or helped to revolutionize economic history by bringing in Darwinian ideas is a, a hope to us in this network. And uh, we look forward to further conversation along these lines and um, in the future. So I'd like on behalf of everyone to give us our warm, warmest thanks to you for your contribution and for um, and starting off a, a, a great discussion today about important right. topics so thank you very much well, thank you so much it was you know my my honor and and my pleasure i i i talk for a living so uh, this is what <laughs> this is what i do and i i i i, I had a ball thank you so much anyway, actually i guess i'm grateful for you to, to make me do this talk because it actually took me back to stuff that i've i've been working on a few years ago and it was sort of nice to come back to it and, and rethink some of the issues so